All right, good morning and happy Halloween. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join us uh, this morning. I know it's a busy time uh, for everyone, so I'm much appreciated. Again, my name is Danny Ree. I'm, I'm the manager of our solutions practice here in our partner and product management organization. Um, and in the spirit of, of Halloween, you guys are in for a treat. Now, if you haven't spoken with uh, Adam Zimmerman previously, I feel like that may change by the end of the webinar. Adam comes to you today with a master's in IT security from the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, where he successfully developed a widely used malware classification tool with a security firm based in Ottawa. And as a professional, Adam has broad experience in the cybersecurity industry, uh, seven years to be exact, um, specializing in security operations, cybersecurity advisory, penetration testing, and advanced exploitation. Where our customers have seen a lot of value is in the consultation of their security practices and the management of potential attacks. And that service is available to all of our customers. And you'll learn a little bit more about that uh, today. Um, now, if that isn't enough, Adam also serves uh, our country in the armed forces as a second lieutenant, specializing in mobile mobility denial and facilitation, tactical breaching, controlled munitions disposal, and various humanitarian support operations. And also last year, you represented the Canadian Armed Forces in a NATO cyber warfare exercise overseas. So, so yeah, he's he's quite the the badass. So, um, with that said, it is my distinct pleasure to present to you, Adam Zimmerman. Well, thank you very much for that <clears throat> very kind intro. Good morning, everyone. Almost afternoon, and uh, let's let's kick things off with our data privacy webinar. So, a brief agenda as to what we're going to be discussing. We unfortunately have to get through a lot of the <clears throat> the privacy information that we are going to be covering, and ultimately, that's defining things like PII, the role of the privacy commissioner. Both of our Canadian legislation pieces that we're going to be discussing is the Privacy Act in very short brief, PEPIDA, which is not going to be called PEPIDA 2.0. It's still um, what essentially our mandatory breach notification requirement will be based upon, which is item number five, and then we'll talk about how we can, how we can help. So just a quick brief agenda here, and let's get on with it. So why is data security important? I get this question a lot. And a quick answer is cybersecurity, much like most intensive tasks, they take a village, meaning it takes the entire organization, not just those responsible directly for security, right? Mutual contribution is the name of the game, teamwork. And then the overall goal is easier to achieve. So PII, this is a common term, and for those of you who haven't heard it yet, stands for personal identifiable information. Right? When you collect information on an individual for business needs, right, you have to protect that information at risk of it being compromised. It can potentially cause harm to the individual in which it was collected. So our privacy legislation defines it as the following. So race, a national or ethnic origin, religion, age, marital status, medical slash education or employment history. I won't read the entire list because we, we can all read that. but. I, these pieces of information individually may mean nothing, but in combination with one another, build a picture of data of an individual, right? So when they are collected as a whole, we must protect them. So knowing that, let's talk about what is not PII, because I actually get that question a lot. So what is not PII are things like a postal code, right? Because if you live, for instance, in a condo building or apartment building or townhouse complex, Right? or even on, a, on some streets now, you have a mutual postal code, right? and it's really just on the mailbox that's in the communal area that everything gets sorted. So it's not considered PII because I have the same postal code as a couple hundred other people. Right? It really comes now down to the unit number or, or things like that, how many homes are in an area. Um, information such as um, organizational information of a business. Right? If you have an About Us page on your corporate website, if that information gets compromised, it's already public facing and it doesn't tie to individuals, it doesn't contain sensitive information, it's not PII. Even if you list, for instance, your chief staff. So if you say, hey, this is the CEO, CFO, CTO, here's a picture of them, their history, that is not considered PII because you are willingly presenting that to the world, right? So very important to know the distinction here. Uh, we can go more in depth 
uh, after the fact if you want to have an offline discussion or continue this after the fact. Um, but that, that is a, a great example of what is and what is not PII. So knowing that, let's move forward. Here's an acronym you may not see often, OPC. It's not the OPP, <laughs> don't worry. It stands for the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and then of Canada. So this is the individual slash the organization that's responsible for upholding our privacy acts, right? So that is, for instance, the Privacy Act, title of the legislation, which has been um, supplemented by the Digital Privacy Act, which is newer, right? And then PEPIDA, which we are going to get into. I'll break down the acronym for those that don't know it, but essentially, that is the bulk of the, uh, we'll call it the meat and potatoes of today's discussion. So the Privacy Commissioner, again, responsible for, um, for seeking, essentially, and upholding compliance within Canadian organizations. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about some quick tips that you could remember, and you might want to print screen the next page, of avoiding the OPC in terms of simple um, compliance measures that you can take so that an investigation may not occur just right out of the gate. So these are quite simple, actually. So go to, for instance, the Privacy Commissioner of Canada website. Just type in OPC Canada. You'll see, for instance, their .gc.ca website come up. And just read about it. Read about what it is the individuals do, uh, what they don't do. That's also important, right? Know what you can and cannot do, always. Train your staff. Right? Have them understand what privacy is, why it's important. Right? It's just like, for instance, when you do phishing campaigns or, or, or email security. You don't hoard that information to yourself. You provide training for everyone to reduce your overall attack surface. So if employees, for instance, understand, hey, maybe I shouldn't leave financial data on my desk overnight when I leave for the day. Right? That's simple, for instance, data privacy. Keep, keep that sort of sensitive data private. That's training 101, right? Security awareness. Take responsibility for enforcing privacy standards. So as of tomorrow, when our legislation changes and this mandatory breach notification becomes effective, uh, the organization should take a stronger stance on data privacy. If you don't have a method of data classification, so prioritizing the controls around more sensitive data, defining what sensitive data is, uh, that's definitely an activity you'll want to start, and we're going to talk about that uh, in depth in the slides to come. So limit the collection of PII, right? So if you are collecting lots of unnecessary data on individuals, customers, whoever you interact with, try and limit that to what is absolutely needed by the business, right? Because the more you collect, the more you secure. Well, the more you will have to secure. A good tip here is for social insurance numbers, right? You don't necessarily require them. And again, based on industry, there's a lot of, of customers on the call, we have a few hundred. So maybe some of you, for instance, are responsible with the government or healthcare in some way, shape, or form require a SIN for identification. If you don't and you're just using legacy forms and that piece of information is still there, remove it unless it's necessary, right? Because that is considered a sensitive piece of information and if taken, will cause a lot of problems, and we're going to talk about that. So that's, con that's creating real and or, and or significant harm to an individual if that data is compromised, which is specifically outlined in the new breach notification. So driver's licenses, I've actually seen this on several applications and, and whatnot. <clears throat> a good example here is if you require government identification to show uh, age uh, of an individual to prove that they are, for instance, above 19 or 21, what have you. Uh, it's one thing to require a scanned copy. It's another thing to, to for instance, state obfuscate the non-related data on the submission, right? So if I were to have to send my driver's license in to prove my age, I would be obfuscating, I would be essentially redacting with, uh, you know, you can be creative in paint or if you have a, an image modification tool, you cover your driver's license number. You cover the things that are not required for the age identification purpose of submitting that, that document, right? They don't need to know your driver's license information. They don't need to see your signature, right? That's something that's important. It could be taken from there and used to replicate 
false payments on your behalf, right? People get creative, attackers get creative with the type of information that they steal. So make it apparent that audio and video surveillance and or recording is being used, right? So a great example of this is every time you call into you know, a customer service department, you get a nice little voice prompt saying calls may be report, recorded for training purposes and whatnot. That's important. That makes you aware that your actions, if they become hostile, will be recorded, right? When they say training purposes, that's a very loose, vague statement. But you need to be aware that you are being recorded because otherwise it's against our privacy legislation, right? Respond to access requests. This is, I would say, relatively new. There are cases of this, but Say, for instance, me as a customer or you as a customer, when you provide information to an organization, they can request to see that information, right? To see what information you've actually kept, um, not necessarily how you're using it, unless they feel you are breaching uh, the methods of collection and purpose, right? So under our new legislation, and we're going to get into that, uh, it defines that you must be upfront about how you're collecting information and how it's going to be used. And I'll give an example as to how that has been violated and uh, dragged through the news recently. So disclose upon request how you collect and use PII. That's on an individual basis, right? You can't have somebody who requests half of your data collection <clears throat> database and say, hey, I want to see how you're using PII. No, because that's an invasion of privacy of the other individuals in that database. And then lastly, obviously, this one's common sense at this point, protect personal information, right? Develop a strong security stack, essentially a modernized stack that has multiple levels of sophistication to prevent such data loss attacks. And I saw a bunch of questions uh, that were submitted in registration asking about what can we do to prevent data loss prevention. We'll get to that in Q&A. In, uh, &A. And I see some live questions coming in now um, after I just talked about data loss. So we'll get to those. So the Privacy Act, yes, we have one. And uh, another question that I'm just going to put to rest here is, is no, none of the legislation or, or changes as of tomorrow reflect GDPR in the EU. I saw maybe 30 of the same question. Um, this is not GDPR. It's, it's not trying to be GDPR. It's just trying to enhance our responsibility as Canadian organizations to protect data. That's really why all of this is happening, right? The Privacy Act specifically relates to a person's right to access personal information, right, that the government holds. So this is for federal entities that exist outside of PEPIDA, which is our next topic, right? So some federal entities are not, uh, are not covered under PEPIDA, but definitely adhere to this, to the Privacy Act, supplemented by the Digital Privacy Act, right, because data is now collected um, in an online manner, um, in most cases, not by physical form, but, you know, that's why I say in most cases, right? So this act is really to control how the government collects and uses your personal information, much like as if it were a business, right? So this is, and, and I'm going to highlight one of these items here, border security, right? When you cross borders, the type of information you provide, how it's actually stored, recorded, and used, you, you can be made aware of that. If you are concerned that the government is misusing your information, well, they have to prove that they're not, right? And that's an easy, an easy request. So again, the Privacy Act only applies to the federal government, and PEPIDA applies to everyone else, with exception, and we'll get into that right now. So PEPIDA, and sometimes when I say this acronym, people don't know what it is, but you are about to find out. So the personal... Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. It's quite a mouthful, but ultimately you could break that up into uh, three and three, right? So personal information protection. It's a simple concept, um, well, at least it should be, right? It really just talks about securing data. And Electronic Documents Act is essentially, so if you just take electronic documents, that's the media, the, the form in which it's collected, right? There's different controls around physical paper uh, information collection and then digital copies of that same data, right? It's stored differently, it's secured differently, it moves differently, right? When I send an email, it's different than physically mailing a letter, yet there are different security controls for both pieces of data. <clears throat> so essentially, PEPIDA is, so much like we just saw the Privacy Act for government, PEPIDA is 
this is the governance and rules for private sector organizations, right? For, for most of the individuals on the line, again, with some exception, right? Again, it's around the collection, use, and disclosure of information across Canada. So some key examples there, banks, airlines, telecommunication companies, they collect a ton of data, right? We're talking about massive amounts. So ultimately, they have a serious responsibility of protecting that and also classifying it. Again, um, a customer number uh, is, is relatively insignificant in a data breach if all that exists in that specific dump are just customer numbers because there's no ties to individuals, right? But if there's, say, customer number, name, address, phone number, credit card number, that's a big one, that's a PCI issue, but there's a lot more granularity when we define sensitive data. So these organizations collect probably some of the most information on individuals outside of some social media companies, but still it's important to understand again that there are rules, specifically ground rules of things you can and cannot do. So for those again who exist outside of PEPITA, so if you're federal, federally regulated organizations, you adhere to the Privacy Act and Digital Privacy Act, and if you're not, you adhere to PEPITA. And there are some exclusions. So if you are not in those two sects, it's part of this, right? It's part of maybe you're a municipality, maybe you're a school or a hospital, but you're covered by provincial laws, whereas PEPITA is federal, right? But the provincial laws will dictate how you are to collect student information, records, grades, transcripts, things of that. If you're a hospital, it's medical records. We have specific medical legislation uh, that affects, you know, dentists, doctors, uh, surgeons, whatnot. Um, potential uh, difference as well as charities. So essentially, regardless of who you are in terms of your, the organization you belong to, you have privacy legislation you must adhere to, right? So specifically, and, and this came in as a, a bunch of questions as well, well, what if I do business overseas? Which, which privacy legislation do I need to follow, right? Um, because a lot of GDPR questions came in. What if I do business with the EU? Well, that's a mixed, a mixed answer. We'll get to that actually in, in Q&A, but a great question. And it means that everyone on the call or those who submitted those questions are really thinking about how this potentially is going to change the way in which they do business. So offenses under PEPITA. These are some common ones. Um, I put this here because, again, a lot of questions were coming up. What are common offenses? Well, here's, some, here's, here's three. So, much like any sort of investigation, the OPC, when they conduct investigations, think of it like, and I'm saying think of it like, uh, a law enforcement investigation. If you knowingly destroy data that is required by the investigative body, then you are committing an offense under our Privacy Act, right? If, if a user requests their information back from you or to, or to see how it is you're actually using their data and you destroy it because you know you're in violation, well, that's way worse than just being in violation, right? You're, you're um, interfering with a federal investigation. And no, the OPC does not charge you criminally, but they work closely with our federal government in these cases, in these federal cases. Um, so another, another big one is retaliation against individuals who complain to the privacy commissioner. It's, it's well within your right to say, hey, I think my data is being misused. Um, <clears throat> So you can't retaliate against somebody for saying that, right? It's, it's, it's their data. Uh, they have the right to, to determine how it's, how it's uh, being used and potentially misused. So you have to prove that you're not doing that. Um, and then obviously obstruct a complaint or investigation by the commissioner or their delegate, an appointed delegate. So again, obstruction in an investigation, much like in a law enforcement matter, is, is criminal. But in this matter, it's not... Again, they're not a law enforcement body, the OPC, but it is still in, um, obstruction in, a, in an investigation. So don't do any of those three things. So the 10 principles of PEPITA. <clears throat> uh, these are some, some key items that you should uh, be made aware of. And essentially, Oh, there's the laser pointer right there. Essentially, it's very simple to follow, right? Um, these can be found on the OPC website. Uh, you can get a little bit more of, of an explanation, but I'll give you a brief explanation of each, right? So 
Principles in general to follow, to adhere to PEPITA, is accountability. We've already talked about that in depth. So let's talk a little more. What does this mean? So this is an or the organization, essentially, that's collecting information should be responsible for that information under its control. So personal information, PII. This is also an important change for probably a lot of those on the call, but you should appoint someone uh, to be accountable for its compliance, right? So this will come up again further down, but create a governance group uh, within your organization, and by group it could be an individual, it could be a team of people, but somebody needs to be responsible for ensuring that, um, that compliance to federal privacy laws are being adhered to. So identifying purposes, so this, this relates to essentially um, the purpose for which PII is being collected, right, should be identified by the organization uh, before or at the time of collection. So say, for instance, uh, you have a banner that pops up, and this is really for the next one for, for consent, um, express and implied, but notifying how data is about to be collected and uh, potentially how it's going to be used. So for everyone who uses social media, you get a banner that probably nobody reads, but it still prompts you with um, some legal and privacy terms of use, and it's implied that you are going to read it. So that is the next one, consent. The knowledge of consent of an individual uh, is required for collection, use, or disclosure of personal information, right? So except where inappropriate, right? Like if you're collecting medical records or medical information, you're not going to then broadcast that to a larger body. Um, but express consent and implied consent are the two forms, right? Implied being exactly as I just mentioned, you get prompted with a window, right, and says, hey, these are the terms of use, these are some of the legal uh, tidbits of information here, um, with a little, I agree that I have read the, the terms, right? So by clicking on that, it's implied that you have read everything above it, right? And you are then saying, yes, I agree, click OK, maybe you're prompted again, or I've seen some um, some of these banners actually have a little bit of, of uh, interaction built into them where you have to scroll all the way down, physically move the scroll bar down to the bottom to kind of symbolize the fact that you actually read the entire box, even though you haven't um, in most cases. And that's more of a stat. But anyways, that's implied consent. Express consent is much like turn a laptop on, computer for the first time, um, and there's a banner, and you click next, next, and next. Um, it's, it's expressed because there's tons of pages, essentially, that you're quickly breezing through, but it's also under the assumption that you're reading those things, that you're aware of what you're about to do. You're using, essentially, someone else's product, and there are rules and regulations around that, much like when an employee is using co um, company-owned uh, media, there needs to be some actionable information presented to them saying, this is acceptable use, this is not acceptable use. These are policies enforced, and this is what you need to be aware of. So limiting collection, this is directly related to the collection of PII, right? It must be limited to which is needed for the purpose of that collection. So information must be collected by fair and lawful means, meaning you can't just develop, for instance, an application, mobile application that collects more than what you need and um, doesn't, and you don't disclose those collection methods to the individual by means of a legal banner. So limit the collection of information to what you absolutely need, and again, you have to define, and which is the next one, limiting the use, disclosure, and retention, right, of that information. So unless the individual consents um, or otherwise is required by law, personal information could only be used or disclosed for the purposes for which it was collection, collected. So personal information must only be kept as long as required to serve those purposes that you've identified. So this is something you're going to have to draft. This is more something your legal department does or, or legal counsel that you, that you use, third party otherwise. Um, you're going to have to draft, again, collection policies and, co and collection processes, how you're going to use information, right? So again, if it's to sign up for you know, a customer portal account or to sign up for this, that, and the next thing, you need to say, well, you know, we're collecting this, that, and the next thing to verify that you are the individual. Here's your uh, remediation in case you forget your password. This is the process. This is why this information is collected. This is how long it's collected for, right? Accuracy, next one. 
Personal information must be as accurate, complete, and up-to-date as possible in order to properly satisfy the purposes for which it is used. Uh, this is important, so I'm sure everybody knows that passports, driver's licenses, health cards, they all expire. Why? Well, it's not just to get that extra $95 out of you every three to five years. It's to keep the information current, right? You, your, your address might change. Your last name might change. Things about you might one day need glasses, and that goes on your driver's license, right? Um, this information needs to be as, as accurate as possible in order to properly enforce the rules in which they're, they're, being, uh, they're being used, right? So your passport, um, your, your physical appearance may change over time. In most cases, it does. Some people are lucky, um, and it doesn't uh, that drastically. But an accurate picture, accurate information of the individual traveling needs to be updated. It's a very simple, simple uh, step. So safeguards. This is probably new for, for some on the call, but hopefully not. So again, personal information must be protected by appropriate security relative to the sensitivity of information. So determining sensitivity. Those types of questions came in a lot, and I'm going to talk about that in, in some future slides, but some, some quick tips here. So again, um, PII in general, as you saw the, the description a few slides ago, is considered sensitive because, again, if breached, it ties back to an individual. But say, for instance, um, we're talking about the Nexus program, which is an advanced, essentially trusted traveler program between uh, essentially countries in the U.S. Imagine if that database or databases were compromised. So if, as part of that program, you submit, there's retina scans as well as fingerprints, right, to prove it's you. And the retinal scans essentially measure um, how light is absorbed into the retina, and that's why it takes multiple pictures or asks you to back up and forward. It's to take readings, right? So imagine that information is stolen. All right, like hashed data on how, for instance, your eyes react to light, which confirm biometric data on you, or how, or your fingerprints, how hard you push, angle of uh, direction when you touch the pad, as well as the actual fingerprints. It's not a password. It's not something that can be changed. This is very important, very sensitive, and in most cases, it would it would adhere to the highest forms of sensitivity for data and its protection. Right? You can't change your irises. You can't change your fingerprints. Um, this is something that is important. Safeguards, and, in, and we're, in, this, in this case, would be exceptional safeguards, so the highest form available would be employed to protect that type of information. Not saying that people on the call collect that, but if you do, that's something you need to consider, is biometric data is not as easy as changing a password, right? There's serious controls that need to be implemented to prevent that sort of theft. So openness. So. This is something that if you ever, for instance, come into contact with the Privacy Commissioner of Canada or an individual that's requesting access to their information, which is really the next one, but openness. An organization must make detailed information about its policies and practices relating to the management of personal information public and readily available, right? So if somebody asks, say, hey, what are your legal policies or your um, acceptable use policies around data collection, and you're collecting data, you have to be able to provide that. You can't say, oh, wait six business weeks and we'll get that for you. No, you must have a policy in place, right? So hopefully uh, a lot of organizations do that are on the line. If not, again, that's something you want to bring up uh, with your legal counsel because that's really something they should be doing or they should be at least spearheading. Individual access. So upon request, an individual must be informed of the existence, use, and disclosure of their information, right, and be given access to that information. So again, it doesn't mean access to your database. It means you should be able to produce a record of an individual that asks for it in the proper legal manner, not, again, by just phoning you up and saying, hey, I want access. I'm John Smith, blah, 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 give me access. Well, it's very hard to verify an individual via phone call. Um, through the actual process, a legal process, you should be able to provide that information. An individual should be able to challenge the accuracy and completeness of the information and have it amended as appropriate, right? So again, if it's a very loose collection process of their data and they feel it doesn't accurately represent them, well, it is now your obligation as the custodian of that data to make it as accurate as possible. So challenging compliance. So an individual, again, shall be able to challenge an organization's compliance with the above principles, 
right? So this is Pepita. Uh, their challenge should be addressed to the person accountable for the organization's compliance with Pepita. So as I talked about before, identifying an individual who will be responsible for this moving forward is usually the chief privacy officer if you have one. If not, it's somebody who, again, you've appointed to, uh, to handle privacy matters. So usually someone in a governance role or compliance. Again, if you have a privacy officer, great. If you don't, it might be a great time to think about one. All right, so now that we've got all the boring legal stuff out of the way, let's talk about tomorrow as of November 1st, right, the breach notification requirement. So there's, there was a lot of loose information that came out of uh, this um, over the last year, not a lot that, that was actually helpful, but um, a lot of people were worried. So, like, for instance, do all breaches fall under this new regulation? That's actually a great question, and I saw a lot of those being submitted, not just live here right now, but prior. No, not all breaches fall under this new regulation, right? It's really identifying those breaches that cause or, or have the ability to cause real risk of significant harm to the individual for which their data was compromised, right? There is a process of determining what uh, constitutes real, uh, real risk of significant harm, and we're going to talk about that. But this is an important distinction to make, right? If an unauthorized individual um, gains access to your network, right, but you have no reason to believe data was stolen or taken or accessed, it's just, for instance, a rogue device that joined the network, well, that constitutes, a, so I'd call that an incident. I would avoid using the word breach as much as possible because breach implies legal action, which is essentially what this whole topic of conversation is about. But if a breach has not occurred, then it is not, it should not be called a breach and therefore is not um, part of the regulation. Again, now it's not also your determination to say, nope, this was not a breach. Look, we see an individual, we have uh, logs in our SIM that shows an unauthorized person accessed a database containing um, a list of personal information, but no data was exfiltrated. Well, that's not, again, a distinction that you should be making because, for instance, I don't need to exfiltrate data. If I'm physically seeing a data dump, a raw dump, I could take a physical picture of that on my phone. I could print screen my device. I have the ability to exfiltrate data without actually performing a data dump. Yes, it's um, completely impractical for data that exists in hundreds of thousands of lines, but it's still possible to see, to view, to exfiltrate, to use data that is found in an incident, in a security incident, against individuals in which it was collected. So. When you have, for instance, telltale signs, IOCs, indication of compromise that show these activities are occurring, it should be reported, and we're going to get into that in the next slide. Not all reports actually res resolve in an OPC investigation in terms of being complete, saying, hey, this is now going um, to the Privacy Commissioner. That is for the investigation to determine. We're not just talking about a, a risk auditor. These are very trained people. Uh, with our Privacy Commission that are looking for telltale signs of a breach. So reporting a breach, right? So there are requirements, right? There is a form. Again, you can, you can download it off the OPC's website. But ultimately, and we're going to talk about how uh, a breach is reported, what happens after the breach is reported, some key identifiable factors to include in the breach will come, or in the breach report will come in the slides. But reporting a breach, it's important, again, that if you believe individuals' personal information that were under your control were accessed and or taken by an unauthorized individual, this is, this is now an obligation to report it. Whether or not the data has actually been taken, it's still, for instance, a, a breach of that, of that data um, custodianship. So somebody who has actually, so if I'm controlling data and I see just in my previous example where my SIM reports to me, hey, this random new user that was created, an administrative user, accessed you know, one of our critical systems and viewed data that, and, and you don't know how it happened, it's not really at that point your responsibility to get to the bottom of it as much as it is your responsibility to report that this incident has occurred, right? So hopefully you have a security organization, so either an individual or individuals that are responsible for investigating this, but that is kind of a we'll call it a side step to the, this whole process is once you realize something has happened that there's no explanation for as of yet, doesn't matter, that is when you start to then approach 
the individual responsible for privacy compliance in your organization and or legal counsel and say, hey, we may have a, an incident here that, that is an unauthorized breach of our customer's information. So a breach of safeguards as defined by PEPIDA is that exact statement right there. The loss of unauthorized access or unauthorized disclosure of personal information resulting from a breach of an organization's security safeguards listed in the act or form of a failure to establish those safeguards. So something that comes across my desk a lot is the, this, this idea that, for instance, I'm a small business. Like, who cares about my data? I, I don't really need to employ certain controls because I'm too small. Well, that is essentially being removed now forever from the equation. That's no longer an excuse. Ignorance of, of security is not going to be tolerated, essentially, moving forward by our federal government. And this is an important distinction, right? Failure to establish security controls is very simple. It's like, for instance, buying a house and not locking your door or not locking anything. Driving your car, not wearing a seatbelt. You can't do it, right? Um, that's a little more of a uh, Highway Traffic Act issue versus the locking of your door is not a federal um, a federal matter, but those are just some examples to help you along the list or uh, along the way there. So there are certain things you should be doing, right? Employing a modern security stack. So again, using next-gen technologies versus traditional, having the ability to, to have granular visibility versus none at all, having a process and procedure to investigate incidents versus not having one at all. These are some simple things you can do that are industry best practice that will help you along this road to readiness, to be more secure, to have the right safeguards in place so that you're not um, constantly being uh, investigated by the OPC. So again, the, the distinction to make here is that it's, it's extremely important that you report breaches. And again, um, if you read the description above, if, if, that, if you have an incident that falls under that uh, determination and that's considered a breach uh, as, as it pertains to our privacy legislation, that you report it as soon as possible, right? So even if you have incomplete information, you haven't gone through the logs, you haven't digitally forensically analyzed the system affected or systems affected, it doesn't matter at that point. You can provide that information as the investigation continues, but it's important that you make that determination. Because say, for instance, you withhold the fact that an incident occurred and all of a sudden a local news agency gets wind of the breach because files are now available online for purchase. Well, if that, for instance, scenario happens, and it actually does happen, unfortunately, well, now you're in violation. And before it could have easily been avoided, right, by reporting it, saying, hey, we think a breach may have occurred, um, unauthorized access to a critical system, blah, blah, blah. That's just a, a quick and easy step. You know, it's an online form in, in, in this case uh, on the OPC's website, and I'll show you how you actually go about that process. Um, so again, if you don't know, ask, but it's better to ask than to stay in the dark. So what happens after a breach is reported? This is another question that I get a lot, um, and the uh, Privacy Commissioner of Canada is, again, very involved in this, but um, they essentially identify an individual, a delegate that will that will lead the investigation, right? And they will will go through the information and and of the incident and determine the damage, right? Determine the the overall impact. So it's just like any sort of security investigation in general. Um, you have an incident response process. You build information, you build an account of the activity that has occurred, you build a potential risk posture about the information, um, those individuals affected, and there is um, a responsibility to maintain that data, and that's going to be in the, in the next slide. Um, so an important thing to note here, though, is the second point. The Privacy Commissioner, um, it's, it's their duty to maintain confidentiality, right? When you report something to the federal government, um, you assume, oh no, it's going to be on a web page somewhere and my organization's name is going to be there. No, it's, it's confidential, just like any legal matter. Yes, there are ways of accessing this information that are on public record, but uh, it's not easily available to an individual or individuals out of the blue, right? Um, so there are some exceptions to the obligation of confidentiality, right? Much like in, in some legal um, aspects, if, if um, certain damages will be a result, uh, it, it may, it's again at the discretion of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada 
individually, but information can be disclosed um, to, be, to share with international counterparts, right? So we're talking about cross-border investigations. Um, it's not available to the public, but it will be available to other entities outside of Canada, outside of Canadian law enforcement in order to aid in an investigation, right? If it's a large-scale attack, Right? Geo boundaries are, are not really a thing when, in cyber warfare because you can proxy hop, you can, you, can, you can make an attack seem like it's coming from anywhere. So if you don't share that information with those agencies responsible for investigating, how are you supposed to find the individual or individuals responsible? It's not going to happen. Right? Um, another, another exclusion here is if the Privacy Commissioner has reasonable grounds to believe that the information uh, could be useful in investigation. Um, within Canada or a province, they may share that information with those parties. And again, it's not the, the, the mass public, but um, that's kind of a side note here where the OPC may disclose information where it's believed to be within the public's best interest to do so. So we're talking about a substantial breach, much like Cambridge Analytica uh, of late. So it was a social media collection of data that was uh, then um, given to a third party, sold to a third party, but that third party violated the, the means in which the data was collected and to be used. So that is a violation of um, our privacy laws and similar to GDPR in the EU, a violation there and similar to privacy laws in the US. Um, that has modified the way in which the acceptable use, collection, and disclosure of information was agreed upon. So the Privacy Commissioner, if that happens to a Canadian organization, may make a statement that can obviously reach the public saying, this incident occurred, this is the wide-scale potential impact. Um, so that's, that's an important note to make, but it's not something that would be done on a, on a common basis. So retaining breach data. If we remember the offenses under PEPITA destroying data, well, keep records, right? Keep records of breaches, keep records of incidents that may not be breaches, um, because essentially a common task for modern security organizations is security maturity, building a knowledge base of what's happening, right? It goes far beyond, hey, look, we're seeing traffic come from this region in the world. It's, hey, look, we're seeing attempts to access um, one of our servers from this specific region and it's a persistent attack, right? It means it's constantly occurring, it's getting more sophisticated each time. That's an important record to keep, but in, re in relation to unauthorized access to systems, that's something you'll want to keep as well, right? You need to be able to prove real risk of significant harm or not. So if data was not taken or if a certain section, a certain part of the PII structure was taken, not as a whole but as an individual, like first name, last name, but that's all that was taken and not the rest of that entire segment, well then that may not qualify as real risk of significant harm and therefore it's not a reportable breach. You don't report that to the OPC. But you have to be able to make that determination. If you don't have the available information to you to make that distinction, well, uh, you know, this is a very circular argument. And I've and and again, we can we can have closed conversations after after the fact. If you want to set up a call, we can talk about this in depth. So, this is the information. This next kind of middle section. Um, I think I have a laser pointer. Oh, there we go. So. Information to include in, in these records, right? So when you're keeping something, when you want obviously some detailed information. So date or estimated date of the breach. If you know something happened, say for instance last month, you don't say sometime in 2018. That's not considered an estimated date. Um, you say for instance between either the physical date, so the 2nd and the 11th, or you say on this day at this time, the breach occurred. If you just have a window, say sometime within the last quarter, at least you're narrowing it down to a section of a few months versus saying sometime in 2018. That's not acceptable. So a general description of the circumstance of the breach, right? So that again, you want to be as general as possible. So you're not providing a list of IOCs on how it was determined a breach occurred. You're just saying, okay, for instance, you had a, an instance of uh, well, it's, well, it's not a ransomware issue, which a lot of questions came up, but you have an issue of, of malware that was exfiltrating data. So that might be a little too granular, but you could say unauthorized access to a system. This is more, again, of a, of a legal um, uh, construct of the actual words you're going to present. 
Um, but you want to be as general as possible. You don't want to go granular. That's for the investigation to, to determine. So the nature of information involved in the breach, again, so this is an important distinction. If it was a substantial list of PII, well, you might want to say what those items were, right? Um, if you're reporting a breach, then it was far more than just first name, last name, right? You'll want to be as um, descriptive as possible, not giving an example of, of an actual stack of data, but you'll want to say, for instance, sensitive information uh, versus um, actually describing what that sensitive information is, because like you want to um, be as open as possible, but again, you don't want to granularly list all the potential types of data you collect. Uh, you just have to determine its sensitivity. You might need to provide an example. Again, that hasn't been um, fully explained yet by the OPC. Whether or not the breach was reported to the Privacy Commissioner of Canada and whether the individuals were notified. So if you have not reported it to the Privacy Commissioner and you've not notified the individuals, you need to explain why, right? Because if you determine it's not a real risk of significant harm to an individual, right, then it's not, for instance, something that gets reported to the Privacy Commissioner, but you may want to notify the individuals for which it was collect, uh, collected. So even if it, it does not meet the standards of real or significant harm, but individuals, uh, for instance, their data was, was accessed, you might want to also notify them. That's, that's being open. That's saying, hey, you know, we had an incident. Um, recently there was, if, um, to give an example, uh, Facebook, they had an incident of unauthorized access to accounts. They forced a mass reset of passwords to uh, tens of millions of users, right? There's no indication that sensitive information was taken, but unauthorized access happened in some cases. So the immediate mitigation was to force password resets and to disable multiple login, uh, so essentially from IPs to, uh, to your accounts. And then everyone gets emails saying, hey, um, password uh, has been changed or, you know, an incident has occurred, please change your password. Right? It's not saying, hey, all of your private information was collected and, and harvested and taken. It's saying, hey, um, there was an incident, nothing sensitive was taken, but as a precaution, reset your password as soon as possible and perhaps employ multi-factor authentication, which everyone should do for everything, but, you know, perfect world. So you must keep breach records when you record this information for two years. So that's listed in the privacy uh, legislation. So don't delete it for a period of two years. So notification requirements. So this, so if you have to go down, for instance, this process, um, and you have to notify an individual, it's as soon as possible or as soon as feasibly possible after you, you've determined that real risk of significant harm has occurred, right? So again, first name, last name, address, maybe not as serious as first name, last name, address, uh, date of birth, uh, medical information, um, purchase history of certain, you know, there, there's, again, when you add on different data points, the, the data itself is a little, uh, a little more substantial and a little more um, harmful to the individual affected. So you want to notify them as soon as possible, but again, this is more something that you enact the individual responsible for regulation compliance with legislation, as well as your legal counsel will, will need to be involved here, right? Because you need to reach potentially a lot of people. Information to include. So again, a description of the circumstances. So don't be granular, right? Be general, because then again, you know, your words potentially can be used by media, by, by, by other entities, twisted or otherwise. So general, vague descriptions are, are, uh, can, be, can be employed here. The day or period in which it occurred, right? If, it's, if neither is known, then approximate. So again, you can't just say, hey, sometime in 2018 this occurred. No, you need to be a little more um, focused than that. But be as, as, as um, accurate as possible. Uh, a description of the personal information that's the subject of the breach, right? The extent of what is known. So if it, for instance, is just first name, last name that was taken, then you just say, hey, the, the two data points that were taken were first name, last name, uh, everything else was stored on a separate database with a tokenized identifier to, again, add an extra layer of security. So this was all that was taken. Something that's, that's simple that says this is the data that was taken. Again, it was taken, so it's an unauthorized access and disclosure of data, but it was not sensitive. 
um, a description of the steps that you've taken to reduce the risk of harm or that could result in the breach. So this is a great way of getting ahead of something and saying, hey, you know what? We realized an incident was occurring. We forced resets of passwords across the, across the organization, across those affected. We uh, moved um, sensitive data that was sitting in an encrypted database to, for instance, a failover environment and employ tokenization on that access with multi, you know, you can get creative here. I can talk about this forever, but it's important to, to identify that steps have been taken to reduce risk for potential future incidents or an advanced threat, right? That you're aware that the incident is occurring and you're rapidly responding to the incident. It's important to communicate those things, right? Um, a description of the steps the individual can take to reduce risk of their uh, of the breach of their information, right, to mitigate harm. So in the perfect example of unauthorized access to a login page to credentialized access, you, you, you walk them through. So this is how you create a password. This is how you create a strong password potentially. Um, this, these are, for instance, how you go into your account and change security settings with screenshots. This is the type of information you would want to, to, uh, to provide. And then contact inf information the affected individual can use to obtain further information, right? You'll probably set up um, a legal entity or, again, a compliance group in the organization that will have a, a helpline for those affected individuals so they can remain current with the information. So assessing risk, right? So for those who have attended our risk management summits, this is a big topic of conversation but identifying essentially some standards of control, right? So enforcing encryption standards across the board. When you're collecting information, data in transit versus data at rest, how it's going to be protected. These are some simple things you can do, right? Um, it's, it's obviously advised that you develop a framework for assessing risk, right? That doesn't necessarily mean threat modeling, how a risk can occur but um, determining impact based on an actual risk being successfully, um, successfully activated. So say, for instance, you have um, plain text protocols on a web server, like port 80, you still allow that sort of traffic back and forth, can be man in the middle, well, you may want to perform a risk assessment on the potential impact of that data being taken and or compromised in, in transaction and create controls around that. Say, you know what, the risk is far too great to accept. We are going to remove this functionality, move towards 443 HTTPS, and move towards stronger methods of encrypting data. That's something that a board can easily um, accept based on research, based on data that you've created, based on proven cases. Some factors of risk to the individual uh, can include, obviously, uh, sensitivity of personal information and the probability that information um, has been or is being misused. So these are two factors that essentially common, or, or sorry, not common, are commonly associated with risk activities is determining sensitivity, right? So data classification. If you have the ability to perform data classification activities, do it. If you haven't done it yet, I would strongly advise that you, you seek help, and, and that's really our next slide, is, is who you can contact to help, right? Um, probability of misuse, so you can ask questions like, for instance, how did this happen? How likely is it to happen again? Um, who accessed the information? Do we have logs for that? How long has this personal information been exposed? How long was it since the incident occurred and we were notified of its activity or of the incident? These are important things to, to ask yourselves internally. So how we can help? You know, CDW is a large uh, organization. If you don't know, ask. Right? If I don't know something, I make very sure that I research it until I do. I like to learn, right? And ultimately, it's really about um, understanding your, your ability to, to be informed. And if you're not, ask for help, right? Knowing all of these uh, legislation uh, capabilities here, everything that will change as of tomorrow, is really only half the battle, right? It's about interpretation, how you're going to take that and employ it into your organization, how you're going to take the information and do something with it. Be more resilient, right? Security hardening and controls, important, right? Policies and procedures, if you don't have those, do that. Start those conversations with senior leadership. Deploy next-gen technolo technologies. Evaluate your overall security strategy. If you don't have those capabilities, we can absolutely provide those capabilities. 
So some next steps would be contact your, your account management team, right? They have access to my team, to our integrated technology team, and we have those capabilities. One of us will be tasked with that and we'll, we'll walk you through what is required, right? What you should be doing. We develop a ton of security content. Me personally, I develop a lot of security articles. It's on our expertswhogetit.ca. It's our CDW uh, website for our, uh, for our solution architects in different categories. We develop a lot of content for our customers so you're aware of what's going on in the industry. Cyber advisory services, you know, uh, Danny talked about that uh, in the early uh, few minutes of, of this webinar. That's something that's available for all of our customers, right? Not just, uh, not just a select few. And we do a lot of research. Personally, I perform a ton of threat research, a lot of um, exploit development and reverse engineering. It's to stay aware of what's out there, right? It's to understand what um, potential threats exist and how we can best combat them. So we have a few minutes left, and I'm going to answer now some questions, some common ones that were, um, that were mentioned. And we, I have actually a list of a lot that were handwritten here for me. Um, for ones that were coming in live, so I thought actually this one was, was relatively interesting. Um, it, it happened more than once, but it was asked, are, are injection-based attacks still a security concern? Um, not necessarily related to the topic here, but they absolutely are. If you're familiar with OWASP Top 10, so the Open Web Application Security Project, it's a top 10 list of threats that face um, that face a lot of entities that exist in the public domain. So SQL injection and other injection attacks are still on there. Why? Because a lot of legacy systems are still in place that use these, these, uh, these insecure protocols and allow for the, um, for the insertion of data to create subroutines and errors, right? So still a top threat. Thought I would mention that because a ton actually came in on, on OWASP. Uh, here's another interesting one. Uh, what's the best overall defense against ransomware? Again, I wouldn't say that's relatively related to this. Can be, but it's a it's a multi-tiered answer, right? Backups. If you have backups and you encrypt your data, well, you're golden. You could just revert back to a state in which was not compromised. If you don't have that, uh, but say for instance you have a matured security team, uh, well, you can develop a forensic capability to perform deep inspection, right, of an of an infected system. Um, if you have a forensic process, you could potentially grab um, uh, one of the keys that's responsible for ransomware, so essentially when it first implodes versus when you pay a ransom and you're provided with a key to uh, disarm that, it's, it's actually running in RAM. So you can, again, if you have that capability, you can extract that and be done with it. Another option is to deploy next-gen technologies, right, to identify, isolate, and analyze malware. So if, for instance, ransomware is attempting to to uh, explode on the network somewhere. Well, if you have sandboxing capabilities, it will be identified, sandboxed, and prevented. If you don't have any of that, well, unfortunately, um, it, you may not be able to regain control of affected systems. So this came up in many words, this next question. So I've kind of refined the question myself, and I see actually at least three of them came in live. Uh, how can I bridge the gap between business politics and my security agenda? Amazing question because very common. So this is common everywhere, right? It's often uh, seen that those in senior positions, uh, in board uh, positions, are not as technologically informed as those in a security organization, right? Because that's not their job, right? But their job is to listen to potential risk, right? Risk management activities that help them see the overall potential damages that can occur based on the current environment, right? So a small investment now to prevent devastation is a far better idea than a large investment later once a catastrophic attack occurs. Um, so another thing here uh, that I see, actually see a ton came in is what are the basic uh, adequate protections for small business, right? Um, there's a lot of you on the call, there's a lot of non-small business customers on the call, but. An important thing to pull out here is when, when the question comes in, adequate protection, well, I would argue that no one should strive for, for mediocrity, right? You don't want to be adequate. You want to, be, you want to have a strong security stance. So aim for industry best practice, right? Um, for those with, that are smaller and have smaller budgets, well, you can't shoot for the moon with tier one vendors because your budget is rather restricted, but hitting the essentials on a modern stack, a holistic mentality saying, you know, it's going to take layers, it's a stack, it's not one product, it's not one solution, it's process with technology. 
So identifying what that is, and we could absolutely help you get there. And then this one actually kind of relates uh, the most. I see tons were, were related to this. Uh, what's the best way to prevent data loss attacks? Right? So data loss prevention is actually a solution title, DLP, and it's an actual next-gen technology that runs either locally on endpoints or on a hosted uh, network environment. So for those who are cloud-based and don't actually have thousands of endpoints. But essentially, it enforces data governance policies, and that's really the next part. Data classification, identify what is critical, what is not, create certain controls for that. So that's all the time we have. I think it actually just hit 12.01. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and uh, we hope you learned something. And again, please, please reach out to your CDW team. We can talk about this further, and we can evaluate everyone's security as, as it exists today. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Be safe out there.